my name is Chris Mitchell. I work at Mitochon Health Center. I'm a CXO, Clinic Experience Officer. I don't have any med medical background, but that's why I've invited uh, Dr. Thurman, who's an endocrinologist, and Dr. Howard, who is on the educational side at St. Louis University, but he did uh, uh, his relevance for being here is we just finished up a study with him. Uh, his our, our, our facility, they did a study for our treatment on our patients, and he'll be explaining a little bit about that later. Uh, what I'm going to talk about briefly is just explain what Mitochon Health Center is in St. Louis, or more specifically Chesterfield what our treatment is and what how it works in our diabetic patients as best explained from a non-doctor. Um, so basically we treat type one, type two, and three diabetics. Uh, they come into our clinic. The treatment takes, oh, let me back up. Uh, the treatment is performed using a, uh, it's called Bionica, it's a pump. It's a um, uh, patented, FDA cleared, uh, pump for delivering insulin in micro bursts to humans. Um, patient comes in, the treatment takes about three and a half to four hours. They're given three one hour treatments with some breaks in between. Well, a break in between. They, they treat, when they begin treatment, there's a blood panel drawn so that our medical director can analyze their, uh, the objective data. And uh, then they start treatment. Let's say if they start treatment on a Monday, then they treat the following day on a Tuesday. Then they treat weekly for the remaining 11 weeks, whereupon another blood draw is done and they meet with our medical director and they decide how they're going to proceed. If they need to continue for another 12 weeks weekly or if they can move to bi-weekly or every three weeks. And eventually the goal is they'll come and treat as needed. Um, diabetics have, many of the diabetics I speak to are pretty in tune with their body and they can tell when their, uh, their energy level is going down or as I refer to it, the gas tank is getting empty. So, uh, this is not a cure for diabetes, but as Dr. Howard will explain in our study we just finished with them, we found several things that uh, were, were very helpful. So now about the treatment itself, again, from my perspective, um, and I'll let Dr. Thurman, if he wants to comment more on the science side of it, but when the patient, a patient, a person who is a non-diabetic, <clears throat> when they eat a meal, their pancreas and bursts or microbursts of insulin through a, what they call the portal vein into the liver and that wakes the liver up. And that what happens when you eat a meal, that those carbs come in, the liver gets woke up and it starts metabolizing those carbs, creating energy that populate the cells on a molecular level to give them the, the uh, energy to do their job. That's the simplicity of it. Our, our pump, um, a type two diabetic as I refer to it, their engine's kind of sputtering. They're not producing, um, the right amount of insulin or the correct amount of microbursts, so they're not doing a great job at metabolizing. Uh, type 1 diabetics, their metabolism is shut down, and that's why they're dependent on insulin, because when they eat anything that has carbs, sugar, uh, they need to have that insulin. Some of them uh, wear a pump even that monitors their sugar level in their bloodstream, uh, so that as the sugar level rises, then they can uh, automatically, subcutaneously, um, insulin is pumped in, which works its way into the system to keep the uh, uh, blood sugar from getting too high. Uh, that's not, it's, it's effective. It's, it's helping out with one of the symptoms, which is high or low blood sugar, but there are many other symptoms that come along with uh, diabetes. So, and it's not, it's not replicating what the pancreas does. Uh, it's entering the, bo the body subcutaneously. So, when the patient comes into our clinic and they're, they get hooked up to the pump, it's via an IV, and then they receive uh, microbursts of insulin throughout the treatment. Uh, we give them a little sugar water to drink to simulate a meal on board, and then those microbursts of insulin wake up the liver, so it starts metabolizing. And then from there, simulates what a, uh, a normal pancreas liver would do. So what's exciting, about what's exciting about this to me, a non-doctor, is that logically it makes sense, but over the past three years that we've been treating diabetics in St. Louis, uh, I've actually seen it uh, when I, when, if they share their objective data, but I can certainly observe it subjectively when they come in and share their stories about uh, many stories of, you know, sleeping better, energy levels up, blood pressure medicine down, 
Uh, they can feel their feet. It, it's interesting ways they explain. Like they won't say I can feel my feet again. They'll say I was walking across my carpet and I felt the carpet like they hadn't felt in a long time. So uh, that's pretty much it in a nutshell about our treatment. And then my non -di my non doctor opinion is uh, re regarding uh, di our treatment for diabetics and how we may be able to help diabetics who have COVID. Is again, we're energizing the cells, and if you have an if you have an energized cell, it's going to fight, and it's going to fight off disease, it's going to, um, help your immune system. It's like uh, patients who currently come into our clinic for treatment. One story in particular, and is our late one of our patients. She and every year she'd get pneumonia, and it was an awful experience because of her diabetes. Uh, it made it more awful. It drug it out longer. Um, since she started doing our treatment, which she has over a year, this year she got ammonia and she was shocked at how fast she shook it off. Um, you know, that's not a, that's the only thing she's done different is she's been on a set. So I think uh, the reason I set this meeting up today is uh, Dr. Howard and I are working on putting together uh, application for a grant because we're just trying to uh, uh, work with the medical community to find some entity out there that would uh, uh, give this a shot and see if we couldn't help. Uh, so that being said, it's kind of what I wanted to share. Uh, Dr. Howard, do you want to talk about the what you're doing? Or Dr. Thurman, do you want to jump in first and talk about the science side or your, your opinions? Who wants to go first? I, I, I can Okay, so um, I, I came into the picture, I think I first learned about the clinic and Chris and the team about two years ago, one of my students, so I'm a healthcare administration professor and a master of health administration at SLU. And uh, I teach a class, uh, a, one of the classes I teach in the program, they do an applied project. And so the student was doing her project. She had some connection. She had met them and was doing the project. And I thought, well, this is really interesting. And we got connected. And then over time, as the clinicians at Mitocon were having more and more experiences with more patients, they reached out to me and essentially what I, as talking with the nurses, the nurse practitioners who do a lot of the work there as well as the medical director and then Dr. Thurman is also, uh, he went through our Master of Health Administration. So we knew each other and got talking about it. We we're both interested. And so uh, we decided with, with Chris and the team to do an efficacy study to essentially get some, some data-driven empirical assessment of whether this works or not. It made sense, a lot of patients liked it, but in the, in the academic field, we, we always wanna run the numbers. So we did that, and I've got uh, some information about that I'll show you. I won't go in nauseating detail, unless you have questions later, I can always follow up. Let's see here, share my screen, PowerPoint. So, uh, Basically, we had two sets of data. We had uh, patients from the St. Louis Clinic, as well as from a sister clinic in Virginia that does the, the same clinical protocol. And uh, what essentially we found was, uh, again, we, we always try to, to ruin the, not, we don't make a cliffhanger, we, we ruin the results in advance. Uh, the, the A1C went down with a statistical significance. That's an important thing on the academic side if you're not familiar with that, as well as triglycerides. And then we also had some other uh, patient survey measures that were not lab results. But the first thing here is just the, the lab results. And of note, so this is kind of from the, the academic journal article we're putting together so that, because we've just finished this analysis. The A1C reduced at a level that was statistically significant, as did the triglycerides. And then this F statistic business down here, if you're not familiar with that, that essentially tells you that the model, the statistical model that we built was, was significant and effective at predicting the outcomes. So that shows that we built a model that was, that was legitimate and worked. Um, so that, and that, so this, so this study had 104 patients between the two locations. So we actually had some good power here. A lot of the studies you, you read in some clinical experiments and, and some others that had predated ours only had very small groups of patients. And it's hard to draw really valid statistics. So that was something we really wanted to do was ensure that we were 
uh, leading the pack on the, the research here on analysis um, on the assessment of this kind of treatment with the biggest group of patients. And then the second uh, data set, we only had about 84. We only had the Missouri only, as you see there. And these were, this was a survey that we do with the patients every time they come in, as well as this vibratory sensation on the feet that we do every time they come in. So that's kind of how that worked. And we had, again, about 84 patients. And what we saw was that that measure, basically that vibratory measure is for neuropathy. Um, as, as Chris was talking about, uh, and Dr. Thurman has mentioned, that losing sensation is one of the most significant uh, comorbidities or complications you can get from diabetes. So we want to keep an eye on that. So we saw that that improved uh, significantly the longer a person was in treatment. And likewise, that kind of their scale of one to 10, how they felt about their health in general was better. And it was especially improved from day one of treatment until whenever they stopped or whenever we stopped collecting data, whichever came first, that on this one to 10 scale, that their, their self-reported health had improved about 25%. So I was impressed with that as well. And those were the significant results. We saw some other things that looked like they were moving in the right direction but, uh, with, I'll say, only 80 to 100 patients. If they don't move a lot, we can't always call that significant. And as uh, academic researcher, it's important to us that, that we not make statements that we can't back up really solidly with the data. And so kind of in a nutshell, A1C declining significantly triglycerides declining as well. That measure of neuropathy in the toes improved very well, and the individual's description of how they felt about their health uh, also improved. So in a nutshell, that is what we found. Uh, so I think that, one thing I was excited about as a researcher is that we went from really good clinic stories, accounts of patients, accounts of the, of the clinicians who are doing treatment and making an impact in patients' lives to be able to test that with our, when we have a three-phase three phased, uh, research approach that we propose, this is the first phase, to take a look at our own patients over time, do they appear to be getting better the more, uh, the longer that they're on the exposed to the treatment. And that's what we found. So that, that was exciting. And uh, looking to move on next, to uh, a bigger study with even more patients when we do a, a controlled group. So I think, Chris, that's good. In a nutshell, were there any pieces that I didn't go through? No, I think that covers it well. Um, so Dr. Thurman, do you want to comment on either the treatment from your perspective just by itself, or do you want to say anything that you have? I know you started to share with Anise at the very beginning. Do you want to share again how you, what the connection you think might be there science-wise with um, a treat, using this treatment to um, treat a diabetic who has COVID-19? Well, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, um, COVID-19 uh, is sets off a huge inflammatory response in the lungs particularly. And, and people with diabetes already have a, a, a pro-inflammatory disease process. Um, when we, 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 you talk about how you know, it's microbursts of insulin now, you know, I'm not diabetic, uh, but my body when I eat a meal starts giving myself microbursts of insulin about every five minutes. Um, now we use an insulin pump or subcutaneous insulin you're giving a flat insulin response. You're not, you're not giving bursts of insulin. So uh, when you give microbursts of insulin, this is normal. So this is what the body sees as normal. So it's, it tries to, hey, I like this. You know, let, let, let's get back to normal. There's a mitochondrial response, which I'm really not going to go into. Um, but uh, uh, it, 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 we know that uh, uh, th through our experience that, hey, things waking up, things start working better. Um, we see significant uh, improvements in neuropathy symptoms. We see significant improvements in, and there's some inflammatory things, uh, which I uh, which I kind of talked about, which I don't want to go into too much detail here, but th there's improvements in, in, in that as well. You know, when I was first introduced to this therapy, I thought, my gosh, this is like, you know, snake oil. This is witch therapy. But I've had patients who've gone into this with severe neuropathy. I mean, crippling neuropathy. 
uh, one of my patients, for example, was a big wig with the uh, um, uh, uh, highway patrol. And he says, doc, I can't feel my hand anymore when I have a gun in my hand. And I said, you need to retire. So um, um, through therapy, I mean, and, and, and pretty extensive therapy, he's able to, he said, doc, I can feel my hand again, but don't tell my employer because I, he may want to work again. But uh, he says, you know, people say, say too, that they can feel the deck when they walk outside on their on their deck, they can feel the the grooves they can feel that but uh, so i i think what you're doing is with this therapy is you're improving reducing some of the inflammatory markers and again uh, uh i can't say this is by any means a cure of covid pure uh, 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 cure for covid but i think you know given the therapy and how it works i think it's a very safe way to potentially treat covid uh, and, and potentially even in, in a, a pre-diabetic or uh, a, a person at risk. I was reading an article this afternoon and looked at patients that were, that were hospitalized with COVID. They had risk factors. They had a disease process going on. Healthy, non-diabetic people were not in the hospital. But those that have risk factors, it could be you know, uh, obesity, could be pre-diabetes, could be diabetes, um, and I think this is offers potentially some degree of normalization of their metabolism. And, 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 and again, you know, we're not quite sure how this works, but anecdotal data, as well as, you know, clinical data that we've seen, it, it, it offers a very promising uh, resource. Okay. Do you, um, and, and I think you said when we've talked, when we discussed this before is, um, Dr. Howard and I were creating the application that um, uh, we, in, in order to test this, we've created an eight to 15 day model where we, sh through polling labs, we should know in the eight to 15 days if we're helping. Uh, but I think you, it's remind, you reminded me of something that because we've had, we've been treating in St. Louis and I know it across the country, other clinics, but I think I always speak specifically of our clinic in our region. Uh, we've, treated for three years with zero negative impact on, on a patient. We've not, uh, I don't know what the medical term is, but no negative outcomes they have left. Side right. effects. Right. There, so, are, there are no side effects. It's safe. I mean, you know, potentially there, there, there can be a risk for hypoglycemia since you're giving insulin, but they're being carefully monitored the entire time they're on therapy. Correct. And then an hour after they leave, we leave them, we send them off with a Gatorade or a juice box and some crackers, and then they check in an hour later. Uh, to give, I, I'm assuming some, well, I forgive me, I don't know the information they give, but uh, they do call in a, a, an hour after their visit. Um, so we do, we do no harm, and so that's what's motivated me to work with Dr. Howard on getting this application for grant study, because it, I mean, why not try it to see? Since You're right. You're right. I mean, you know, um, I would even suggest even in the non-diabetic, I mean, th th this therapy is, 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 I mean, you're not dropping blood sugars. You are probably improving insulin resistance uh, in the long term, but I don't think it would hurt at all. Right. At all. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's safe. It's, it, it's uh, insulin pulse therapy, but you're, 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 you're mitigating hypoglycemia by giving them glucose right. early on. Right. So, so I, I, I think, all, I mean, literally all you're doing is giving the small doses of insulin. One of the things that's interested me so much, again, as a, as a researcher, as a health outcomes researcher, not, not a physician, I, when I first came into this study, I thought of diabetes really more as a sugar-related disease, right? Because every diabetic I knew, they're always monitoring their sugar, and I'm always hearing about glucose and A1C levels. And the more I dug into it, you know, consulting with you, Dr. Thurman, and others, I read the inflammation is a major aspect of what's really going on inside the body. So I think that's what really perked up uh, my interest when the pandemic started and I heard about the COVID-19 having such inflammatory effect. If we can address an inflammation in a diabetic aside from COVID-19, might we be able to do the same thing and get some helpful impacts on a diabetic, maybe others, as you've said, who uh, are dealing with the disease and maybe exacerbating that issue of 
of inflammation. So that's kind of where I'm excited. I wish that in our initial trial, I had had uh, multiple measures available for the inflammation uh, biometrics that you mentioned, Dr. Thurman. And that wasn't something I had in the previous, uh, the previous study, but we'll definitely be sure that, that we are getting from the lab company uh, in the future study. Well, I uh, just don't understand how it's working. Right. right. Uh, does anybody have any questions, our attendee? I put it in the chat box. <laughs> no, I don't actually, I don't have any questions. I was writing all kinds of notes down because I think that information is really, really helpful. Um, like I said, we, we have a strong history of diabetes in my family. And the whole time you were talking, I was actually thinking about my father who has neuropathy and has, you know, all these other things that are going on as well. And I was like, wow, you know, this is such a great, um, such a, a a really great therapy that that could help many um so i well i guess i do have one question what is the difference between what you are currently doing versus someone maybe giving themselves like just small amounts of insulin like with small bursts of insulin just through you know through their pump or through just injections i'll answer that one um, so when you give subcutaneous insulin you're giving insulin that is slowly absorbed over the course of one to potentially 23 or 24 hours. Okay, so if you look at Humalog or, or um, Humalog or uh, uh, Novolog, that's an insulin that's given, um, the, the shot is given and over the course of about two hours is absorbed. Now my body, I'm not diabetic, my body when I eat a meal, um, it gives, we, we describe it as microbursts of insulin. So it gives small amounts of insulin every five minutes. You can't replicate that with Humalog or Novolog. Uh, likewise, overnight, my body has this built-in glucose sensor um, in, uh, in the pancreas. And, and uh, uh, it's, so it starts seeing the sugars going up about two or three o'clock in the morning. So it starts giving small amounts of insulin. Now, if your father or whomever is on um, NPH Lantus, let's say to J or Traceba, that's, that's a, a slowly absorbed insulin. Those insulins, all they do is lower the blood sugar. They don't normalize the metabolic response to hyperglycemia, nor do they, they um, act like a normal, normal non-diabetic pancreas. Again, so you're, you're, you're giving a dose of, of human log to cover the meal. So maybe five units, 10 units, whatever, but it's slowly over the course of uh, an hour or two absorbed. Whereas um, when you do this therapy, you're giving IV insulin pulse therapy. Every four to five minutes or so, you get a dose of insulin. And it wakes that liver up and says, hey, you know, this is what normal feels like again. Let's get back to normal. Whereas a shot of human log or Novolog, that is not, all that is doing is lowering the blood sugar. It's not having really the metabolic effect uh, um, at the level of the liver that uh, we see with this therapy. Dr. Thurman, could you briefly explain also the impact of subcutaneous versus intravenous? Is this an infusion, so that's different, right? Well, IV is going to be absorbed right when you give it. So you're giving, actually, you're giving regular insulin, which is an older insulin. So um, uh, it, it looks just like my body's insulin, but you, you, it's absorbed much quicker. Uh, the liver sees it much quicker, whereas if you get a sub, uh, you know, subcutaneous dose of insulin, it's going to take you know, 30 minutes or even up to an hour before the liver sees it after a meal. So, but it's very flat. Whereas IV insulin, we're giving it to you in both in, in, in boluses, very, you know, small amounts of insulin, just pulses of insulin. Um, uh, and over the course uh, of an hour with this therapy, as opposed to uh, subcutaneous insulin, which might take again, you know, one to six hours even for it to be totally absorbed. And Dr. Thurman, you can give your medical terminology or opinion on this, but Anise, my uh, team explained to me that when the patient comes in and they're given uh, this treatment over three and a half to four hours, the reason it keeps working in their body even when they leave is we wake the liver up, which I call the engine. We get it running. It leaves the clinic and it doesn't stop running. In fact, it's important we encourage them to eat healthy carbs, but it's important for them to continue to eat carbs 
to keep the engine fed and keep it giving it the fuel to run. And the reason we start out with treatment on a Monday, Tuesday, or back to back, wake that liver up, get that engine humming uh, at 100%. Then after a week, what we have found over the our what uh, the you know, the creator of the pump had found over uh, the last many years is about a week later the engine will stop running. But you do it every week, and then after the 12 weeks, you pull the blood panel to see effectively how they're improving, and then ask talk subjectively, and then you start treating less because as your I think as Dr. Thurman referred it, the body likes it, and as it resumes normal, it like it likes that, and it keep, it continues it. Am I saying that correct, Dr. Thurman? Well, from what I understand, when you give um, microboluses of insulin IV, you're 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 converting metabolism from uh, lipid metabolism, that is triglycerides, to carbohydrate metabolism. So the liver, after a period of time, starts saying, hey, listen, I like this carbohydrate metabolism, not the lipid metabolism. Right. So it, it, it becomes more efficient. So when you, when you give microbursts of insulin, like in a normal non-diabetic person, uh, uh, again, you're converting um, uh, that, that patient from um, uh, lipoprotein metabolism to carbohydrate metabolism. Uh, it starts again. It starts liking it, and and, and that's more. It's more normal. So that that's the thought is the, the the premise behind your 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 therapy. And in time, like I so, said, you know the body starts getting used to it. Starts saying, "Hey, this is normal. I like this." Uh, so even you know stretching therapy out from you know one to two days out to once a, a week or once a month, uh, the body has this memory. I like this. So let's, let's get back to carbohydrate metabolism versus lipid metabolism. I recall early on when we first opened in uh, February of 2017, I remember we had a, a gentleman who was coming in and he was uh, one of those um, low carb eaters. And he was so trained, it took him a while to realize that he had to eat carbs. He was so trained, you know, low carb, low carb, low carb. And um, it was hurting him. It was, he was starving his engine. We'd get it running, and then he would, uh, uh, because he was not feeding carbs, his, it, it, it would stop. Well, so people getting diets, like you're talking about, are horrible. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, I mean, people do lose weight, but, I mean, they're horrible on their, on their metabolism. Um, uh, I mean, I, I've, I've just seen, it, 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 and when they fall off their yeah. diet, uh, the ketogenic diet, they, 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 just engage themselves in a carbohydrate feast for a while. So, I mean, I, I don't recommend ketogenic diets. I recommend a, di a regular diet for my, for my diabetic patients. You know, it's, it's, you know, normal food is easy to get, but in moderation. And I guess I'll put out there into the uh, Venture Cafe world that um, if anybody who watches this um, would like to reach out to Mitochondrial Health Center if they have information. Uh, Dr. Howard and I are going to be looking, we're going to be sending out applications to various institutions that are offering grants via COVID. Um, so if anybody has any information they'd like to share, they could also just call us at Mitochondrial Health Center. Other than that, I, I guess we're finished. <laughs>